My name's Matt Cook and I've been working with the Dragons for about 14 years. Um, I work with a, a wide variety of reptiles and amphibians at the zoo um, and I've always specialised in herpetology but I've been fortunate enough in the last sort of yeah, 14 years, like I say, to specialise in dragons which is a real privilege. Uh, Komodo dragon is obviously the largest lizard in the world, something that, that everybody, they're almost famous for as well as their um, their sort of appearance is, is looking like dragons. They're obviously a monitor lizard really, but they look unlike any other monitor lizard just by their sheer size and, and their frame and their natural history as well. So they, they have a very unique feeding mechanism really, uh, not only on what they feed, because they feed on very large animals, but also their mechanism for capturing uh, prey. So they're, they're obviously a savage predator, they're very, very efficient predators, and they have very sharp teeth and venom, which can take down um, even a buffalo potentially if it's weakened. So it's a very impressive animal to take down a, an animal like a buffalo. Uh, they're found in Indonesia, only on a few islands, which also makes them unique because um, those islands are completely unique to Komodo dragons. Um, they, they're found on Flores, Komodo and Rincha and a couple of the others. And um, it's only actually in recent years that they fully mapped their distribution, which also I find fascinating about dragons because being such an incredible species, you'd think everyone wants to work with them and they do. It's just logistically where they come from is quite remote. Uh, it's very tricky to, to navigate and just simply uh, tracking the animals was, was always difficult. So it was only in recent years that the full distribution, particularly on Flores Island, which was the island that hadn't been well studied, had been fully mapped out. And the dragons generally live very close to the coast. So when you go further, Flores is a much larger island, Komodo and Rincha. On Flores, they're fairly restricted to the coastline and that's based on the habitat really. They need savannah and they need dry monsoon forest and they need to be able to thermoregulate between the two different habitats. Uh, probably prey abundance and things also are, are better there. It gets very dry inland um, and the humidity from the ocean and the sea obviously helps them I, I imagine. Um, and they often are found along the beaches as well where they can get easy food. This is our main Komodo dragon enclosure at the zoo and we obviously, our main aim uh, with all of our exhibits is to make them as natural as possible. We're very fortunate to be able to buy in plants. We have a botanics team that can help us out with plants. Uh, Komodo dragons are uh, large animals and often squash anything that I put in. So some of my poor plants over there are being folded over just simply because the dragon just walks all over them. These things, the spikier the better. I find in, on Komodo and Rincha, the uh, plants that look thorny are pretty thorny and the ones that don't are really thorny. Um, so everything's spiky and they obviously have their strong skin to cope with that so it's not a problem. It just creates not only a more attractive display and I think even at home they just look nicer. Um, obviously they help with the humidity because we can water these plants, they hold the humidity a little bit better and just create a more natural um, enclosure for the animal. And he's obviously moving through all these plants, it, it creates a 3D enclosure. I always want to make my, my enclosures as, as three-dimensional as possible. For enrichment purposes I sent the enclosure down. I sometimes sent on the ground but sometimes I sent up high and it just it just pr promotes them to, to stretch their neck out smell up smell up again creating a 3d environment get got all these things um, I often have little bits of log and leaves in here anyway I, I change it mix it up so some of the logs on the floor I might make a big scent pile put loads of smell there I might even hide food in there and it just promotes the dragon pulling the leaves away knocking over the logs and, and that's that's a, that's a good enrichment to use Working with Komodo dragons is an absolute privilege. It's something that I, I honestly, I don't take for granted. Every day is incredible working with Komodo dragons. They are different from any other Varanid I've worked with. Naturally, an adult Komodo dragon has no predators other than other Komodo dragons. I've been to Komodo and Rincha and, and been very lucky to go. And when you go there, depending on the time of year, the dragons are pretty relaxed. They're lying right there next to you. And okay, you've got your rangers with their forks just in case, but they're just, they, they own those islands. They're like an animal that have an arrogance about them. The way they walk, they have an arrogant strut as they walk around, like they own the islands. And they just have no fear at that age. And other than other Komodos, which they wrestle, they, and they might, they might compete for territory, but it's, it's, it's within the species. 
Not only are they an incredibly charismatic, huge reptile, but they had a lot of secrets up their sleeve, a couple of massive discoveries in recent years. And one of them was the fact that they're venomous. Um, it's surprising that it wasn't discovered earlier, really. They have a gland in the lower jaw, um, just like the Gila monster and the beaded lizards in the lower jaw. It's a much, much more primitive gland than the snakes, and the delivery system is much more primitive as well, because snakes with the fangs have a hypodermic needle, and it's a very efficient way of, of delivering the venom. Komodo dragons is, again, like Gila monsters, beaded lizards, it's, it's the lower jaw, and it oozes through the gum line. The teeth are serrated, so it causes a massive, nasty wound that is very messy. Uh, the anticoagulant venom is seeping into the body. It's causing shock initially as well, which will make the animal more vulnerable, but it's also causing the blood to really bleed a lot more freely. Most of the zoos that hold dragons, are all, well, they're all under the same uh, breeding program, so all working together. It's not like each uh, zoo has their independent. I mean, obviously, you can manage the dragons how you like to an extent, but everybody's kind of working together and collaborating. And one of those collaborations is funding. So everybody is, is putting money together per year and it goes directly to the Komodo Survival Program. And that's the program that is actually running now doing all that conservation work in the wild. So holding Komodo dragons in captivity is directly funding the conservation work in Indonesia. We've helped the whole ecosystem in Indonesia and uh, that, that's uh, an incredible thing to be part of and I'm very, very proud of how that project runs.